So as we look at fossil groups, and we're going to start off with cyanobacteria, actually, and some of the other microfossils, uh, we're really talking about uh, things that are really microscopic in scale. So they usually don't leave too much of a record, although the forams leave a bit of a record, and the diatoms and radial area, they all leave a little bit of a record, but uh, the stromatolites, in fact, are more of an organosedimentary structure as opposed to an actual living fossil. So the body of it is actually composed of sediment that was trapped by the organism. And so in a way, these things are almost like trace fossils. Now, they're not really technically trace fossils. They're regarded as body fossils, but at the same time, they're really organosedimentary structures. So if we go into the categorization of stromatolites, we have to start in the domain bacteria and then the kingdom eubacteria, the actual true uh, bacteria, in other words, and Monera, in fact, is the, uh, is the group it used to be referred to. And cyanobacteria is the phylum. So they're filamentous and coccoid algae. Filamentous means that it's like a string, if you will, or filament. And then uh, coccoid means that it's like a string of balls sometimes. And so these little tiny microscopic cells would line up along a filament, essentially, and be like a filament, in fact. So most stromatolites are the result of the trapping of sediment from these filamentous and coccoid algae. It's a little bit like flypaper. The sediment sticks to the filaments, or it sticks to the, the coccoids. Uh, so they're little tiny things. They do have chloroplasts in them. So that's really important because because they have chloroplasts, they can photosynthesize. They make energy. And as a byproduct, in fact, so if there's any carbon dioxide, they're going to absorb that carbon dioxide, generate some energy, generate the glucose out of that, and then they give off oxygen. And so, in fact, stromatolites are really important for us because they not only trap and bind sediment, they also produce atmosphere for other living creatures that rely on oxygen to breathe, to, to you know, respirate and to, uh, photo, uh, to metabolize the, uh, the energies. So um, there are not just ancient uh, stromatolites. They, they've been around for like two and a half or almost, well, three billion years. And so they've been around and they hit their peak in the Proterozoic, as you well know. But then they kind of took a hit when living organisms began to prey upon them and come along and trim off the, the uh, filaments and the uh, coccoidal algae that would stick up uh, out of these stromatolites. And so they get grazed a lot, okay, by things like, well, like snails. Snails have what they call a rasping tongue, and so they, on their tongue they can essentially rip up the pieces of... Uh, of stromatolite, or the eubacteria, that are growing on stromatolites. And so we recognize them from their creaky, crinkly laminae. Okay, so there are other sorts of things that will generate laminae. Laminae are just thin beds, essentially, but these are ones that tend to be, because they're living organisms and a little bit grows more than the other one, they tend to be a little bit crinkly. So there are different forms of stromatolites as well. Uh, you'll hear the, hear the term digitate stromatolite, which means it's finger-like. So sometimes they're about the size of your finger, and they grow upward in the sediment. Uh, other ones are called domal stromatolites, so they can be quite large, in fact, maybe meters across. But they grow in a dome sort of shape like this, surrounded by sediment, perhaps. And then also there are planar stromatolites. Have said, you know, planar stromatolites would grow in maybe like... Uh, uh, places that are like tidal flats, and so tidal flats very commonly may have interbedded algal growths or cyanobacterial growths across them. So those are called uh, planar stromatolites. And there's other ones that are out there as well. Um, you know, there's a, a guy who came up with an elaborate explanation at one point, laterally linked hemispheroids and so forth. So there's all sorts of different shapes to these things. But if we go, there are some living ones today. They are in the Bahamas. They are in South Texas. They are in places like the Persian Gulf. And so those are places where you would see stromatolites. Now, as far as we know, the oldest ones are about 3.5 billion years old. Now, that's pretty amazing when you think about it because at about 4 billion years ago, that's when the moon was formed, okay, from that massive, that massive impact of a Mars-sized um, struck you know, a planetoid that uh, to hit Earth and made Earth larger and the moon smaller than what that impactor was. Uh, 
They hit their peak abundance, that is the stromatolites hit their peak abundance about 1.3 billion years ago, and then they declined during the Cambrian time, and that came along with the snails, brought their downfall pretty much. But they've been able to exist in extreme sort of environments ever since then. So um, they're pretty common in the Paleozoic, I'd say. Um, they tend to be in restricted environmental settings where places where snails don't want to live necessarily. So that's one of the things that protects them. So hypersaline water, water that's very salty, tends to exclude most living organisms because we can't live in a salt-enriched uh, setting usually. But uh, stromatolites can do just fine there because all they do is photosynthesize to make their energy and trap sediment, of course. And so um, they're also found in freshwater lakes today. So in New York, for instance, there are freshwater lakes where you can get stromatolites at the base. So, okay, you might call this stuff pond scum also, but it has to have that sort of filamentous and coccoid algae and the ability to trap sediment into a organosedimentary structure. So uh, today, uh, Brazil is another place too, by the way. So Shark Bay is in Western Australia. Uh, Eczema Sound is in the Bahamas, and so that's a place where there's really high rapid tidal uh, current energy that, that keeps most of the grazing organ, organisms down. Uh, in Shark Bay, it's hypersaline water. They, they get very little rain, and it's very, very hot in Western Australia. And at Laguna uh, Salagata at, uh, in Bahamas, I'm not sure exactly what the setting is there, but those are three of the places where today you even have uh, living stromatolites. So we're going to go on a little field trip, okay? Here are the stromatolites of Shark Bay. That's where they're located at. And so that's Shark Bay down here. And, of course, the sharks will swim in and out of here. But this is part of the upper part of Shark Bay where it's really hot, really hypersaline. And it's a place where it's episodically inundated with water. That allows the algae to not dry out in the desert, you know, but remain wetted during the high tides and so forth. And so these are areas that are exposed to some tidal activity as well. Um, you can see where Shark Bay is on the map of Australia then over on the left-hand side here. Um, here is a close-up photograph of some of the stromatolites. Now, it's not that close, in fact, and so the algae itself, or the cyanobacteria, doesn't show up as a blue color on here. It's actually the brown color, and those they may be algal mats, but there's a lot of those, in fact, are stromatolites. So we're going to zoom in on that. But there are different depositional environments here, I guess I would say. In number one there, that's subtitle, that's below the low tide level that you can see here. And then in between that, you get in the inner tidal, so that's in between mean high tide and mean low tide, and the water comes in and floods over the stromatolites. And then at the highest of the high tides, that area gets episodically, very carefully, maybe once a month or so, gets wetted by high oceans, by high tides. And on this also you can see the tidal channels and there's some islands in fact that are uh, surrounded by these channels. Uh, so the stromatolites themselves are going to be the brown parts on here. So we're going to look at that up a little bit more closer. And so here you can see where it's been hypersaline and the salt has actually evaporated in the super tidal setting. That's on the lower right hand side here. But all across the top and through the middle part of this image, you can see the brown areas on here that are part of that algal growth or that cyanobacterial growth. And you can kind of see some uh, granularity to it as well. Those are individual stromatolites that are beginning to show up at this scale. So this is a Google Earth image that I grabbed, and it's very handy for, for looking at individual stromatolites. So if we get uh, a little bit closer, this is kind of what you would see then. So this is somebody's photograph of Shark Bay. It shows you the stromatolites sticking up like little cauliflower heads uh, through the sediment. And, you know, these are relatively short ones right here. They can be up to like two or three feet high, some of these things. And then the tides would go up and down over the tops of these things, keeping them wetted and keeping them from completely drying out. And so they're able to photosynthesize typically when the water uh, covers them like that. And so when the water's over them, they can grow with their filaments and their coccoidal sort of extended extensions of the microbial portions of these stromatolites. And then as the currents get generated by the tidal activity, now this is a very calm day here, but it's not always that calm. And so the sediments would come by and that material would then stick to the stromatolites.
here's what they look like in profile then. Uh, you can see the water level right there, right near the top. And so, and so in this case, the sediment is pretty far down there in this case. So these are ones that are maybe a foot and a half or two feet high, even above where the water level is in this photograph. Um, so those are some of the exemplary stromatolites that you would expect to find in Sharks Bay in uh, Western, Western Australia. The ones from the Bahamas are slightly different. Uh, this is a, a satellite image, I think it's Google Earth image again, of, um, of what it looks like in between Florida, Cuba at the bottom, and then the Great Bahama Bank. And that's actually uh, Eczema Sound over on the right-hand side over there. And then there's a feature called Tongue of the Ocean. That's that deep water sort of inlet that is on the east side of Andros Island. So Andros Island is the biggest island in the Bahamas. And so with that, you can see how the seas, when tides are high, are going to flood onto that bank, Great Bahama Bank. And the water depth there is maybe 12 feet. Uh, it's pretty shallow. Um, I've been across there one time when on, on a field trip in geology in, in Kansas, and we were looking at how modern carbonates form. We did not make it to the southern end of Tongue of the Ocean, however, but if you look at the southern end of the Tongue of the Ocean there, you can see these tidal bars. And so the tidal bars there, in fact, are associated with ooids. Ooids are these sort of like little tiny oh, concretions of, of aragonite, mostly in today's oceans, and they grow by adding layer after layer of, of aragonite onto these sort of small spherical features. And so to be an ooid, you have to be two millimeters or less in size. And uh, these are actually tidal bars right here. So the tides come in, taking that deep water onto the bank, and then when the, when the tides fall, then the water flushes back out from the bank into the deeper water in Tongue of the Ocean here. So a huge amount of both current activity from the tides and then wave activity from the deep water that's in uh, Tongue of the Ocean here. And so if we zoom in on that, this is kind of what the tidal bars or the, the sandbars look like in Ouids. And here on the right-hand side, you can actually see some of the stromatolites from uh, that southern end of Tongue of the Ocean here where the Ouids are sticking to the filaments. And so it doesn't matter what kind of particle it is. In this case, there are little tiny Ouids, these concentric uh, roundish sort of like little, little uh, carbonate pellets, if you will. They're not really pellets, but they are accretions or concretions, if you will. And they stick to the stromatolites. And so the stromatolites, you can see the sort of like green scum on one of those. Well, that's the stuff that's you know, growing out of that organosedimentary structure and allowing the ooids to then stick to the outer surface of this. Okay, so these people that are diving around these stromatolites, what they do, they sometimes get out there with an underwater saw and cut these things apart and then study them. And so that's what geologists do very commonly. But those are two of our modern analogs for stromatolites in the modern day environment. So we have to think about either hypersaline water or water that will stress any organism that tries to prey upon that, that you know, green cyanobacterial growth. And so they have to be places that are pretty tough for animals to live in. And so we call those extremophiles, really. Um, in the ancient record, they're much more common. And so uh, this is a photograph from Saratoga Springs in New York. And these, before people knew what they were, they look like cauliflower, sort of, right? Again, really pretty good size. And again, I don't have a, I don't have a, a scale in here. This is not my photograph, but you can see how they're sort of round in shape. And these would be like domal stromatolites that have been truncated. And you can see the layers in them, in fact. And so, if there was erosion across that surface, it's going to bevel them right off, like taking a, a you know, a, a surface grinder across that surface, and you can see the internal workings of what a stromatolite would be like adding layer by layer by layer as these stromatolites both go up and out. And uh, so these were known as cryptozoan. So early on, people thought they were some sort of animal. Crypto means hidden, and zoan means animal. And so a hidden animal would have made these sort of structures, they thought. That's before they figured out that there are actually some living organisms that are identical to these things. And so cryptozoan mounds, if you will really stromatolites. And so we call them stromatolites. Um, 
Here are some in cross-section. You can see the layers and how they build up through time. Uh, people have done studies counting these things, and sometimes there's a connection to tidal activity. Um, these are the cryptozoan ones again here in cross-section. Uh, there are some out in the west in places. These are my photographs here from Utah and Nevada. There's a preponderance of carbonate strata that were deposited back during Cambrian or Ordovician time. And these are actually Cambrian over on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side as well. But you can see how they grow up like posts, essentially. And so those are called columnar uh, stromatolites. So, so columnar, digitate, domal, uh, lateral link hemispheroids. You can call them all sorts of things. And they just record, you know, algal growth or cyanobacterial growth where you can see these things were growing upward in the sediment around them. Like little tiny islands, essentially, but, you know, big enough to, like, cause an obstruction. And then the sediment would then stick to the stuff. Um, there's actually another term that gets thrown out with stromatolites. And, very, and that's the upper uh, photograph here. They're not really genuine stromatolites, but they tend to be from a subtitle setting. And they're called thrombolites. And so if you're familiar with human biology at all, you know that lungs have thrombi in them, and those are the air sacs and so forth that we have in our lungs that allow us to exchange and, and enter, have oxygen enter our bloodstream. Well, these thrombi are well, kind of the shapes that you see with thrombolites, and so they would be considered to be something of a shallow subtitle sort of equivalent of what is a stromatolite, which would typically be an inner in an intertidal setting. And so uh, thrombolites and stromatolites are like this. And so thrombolites, yeah, you can maybe add that term to your lexicon, your vocabulary, at least for now. So you can learn it for the exam. <laughs> for the, you know, it'll, be in the, it'll be on the lab final, right? But um, here's some more col columnar stromatolites. And the only way you can really see them is because of the infilling between the columns in this case. And so you can see that there's a different sort of weathered, uh, iron-rich zones that are orange in color uh, that are vertical. And so they kind of separate the various columns, these columnar stromatolites in this case. Uh, if you look down on these things, very commonly they have that concentric sort of pattern as well. They sometimes grow together. You can sometimes see channels through them. And in fact, during Precambrian time, and on into Cambrian time, in fact, cyanobacterial played a major role in shallow water carbonate settings where they would form reefs. And so reefs were very important all through the, the Proterozoic, pretty much. Even though they first evolved in the Ar Archean, they existed for a long period of time. And so these were some of the earliest reef-forming organisms. And so what you see here are some from Texas along the Llano River, or Llano River, and, and so you can actually see the, the concentric laminae that bind together like three uh, columns, or four columns in this case, in that middle zone there. It kind of casts a shadow on it there, but you can see the areas in between the columns then that are kind of rusty in color as well. Um, so stromatolites are kind of an important organism. They, they again, are organo-sedimentary structures. Organo, or their organic filaments in cochoidal eubacteria, their cyanobacteria that would then photosynthesize, growing upward in the photo, photic zone and uh, binding and trapping sediment. Here's some more. These, I think, are also from Texas here. They're really amazing, some of these things. And so they can get into these sort of elongate shapes. The reefs themselves can even have some unusual sort of features that seem to be repetitive through time. Coral reefs will sometimes grow perpendicular to a shoreline where they actually form what they call spur and groove structures. And stromatolites could do the same thing because of the positive feedback loop that you get in between the tides and how the water flows around obstructions essentially on the sea floor. So here, here are some more stromatolites. Here's some more stromatolites. I've been around stromatolites, I guess, a little bit too long, but... They are strikingly beautiful, actually, and so we're going to go look at one. We, we collected one from the Davis Formation, and it's in our, our showcase, in fact, up around the atrium where all the rock samples are there. We've got a big domal stromatolite in there, and I think we still have the one in the lab where you can actually see where they've cut it. 
we delivered one of these things from outcrop or road cut. It was taken from that road cut, brought back, and then so somebody sent it down to where we can actually uh, get it slabbed. And so we have a slab of a stromatolite. Now it's very, it's not easy to see the lamina in it, okay? So they're almost like thrombolites, but at the same, we think that they're probably stromatolites. There is some faint layering in them. Here's some more stromatolites. Okay, so you get a lot, you get the idea here. These are more like mounds, if you will, well, kind of hemispherical. There's some columns on the left hand side, and they all go up to a surface that is a truncation surface. This is from the Cambrian, so there are a lot of sub, sub, sub aerial and actually submarine truncation surfaces too in, uh, in Cambrian carbonates. And so Cambrian rocks are really pretty darn neat. They, they don't get bioturbated a lot, and so these are you know, bioturbated means burrowed. Okay, so these are ones that are preserved, and so they haven't been munched on too much either. So uh, that's a surface of erosion up here below the darker gray layer at the very top up here. Those are the sort of surfaces that uh, tend to reflect some sort of change in the climate. Okay, so those are pretty important as well. So stromatolites here and even more stromatolites. Uh, yeah, stromatolites are pretty darn cool if you ask me. So here in these stromatolites, you can see that there are a whole series of columns that are adjacent to one another. And, you know, they've been removed by erosion at the top, but modern erosion in that case, just an outcrop that happens to be a little bit weathered right there. Um, one more example of a stromatolite here. Here's a stromatolite that's growing up on one of those truncation surfaces that happen to be just a little bit higher, and you can see a pinnacle stromatolite growing upward, but it's surrounded, in fact, by little rounded versions of a stromatolite, and those things... Okay, so now you know the term stromatolite. It's an organosedimentary structure uh, caused by the trapping of sediment by filamentous and coccoidal algae. You also know the term thrombolite, which is a, a, a type of um, stromatolite that would grow in slightly deeper water where it doesn't get the fine laminae that you usually get with like stromatolites, which are in the intertidal sort of setting. In this case, we're talking about probably intertidal setting again, but that algae is actually broken apart. And these things will actually roll around and get their accretions that way. And so these things, not like ooids exactly, these things are what we call oncolites. And so oncolites comes from the term onc, which means a lump essentially. And so an oncologist, for instance, is a specialist in treating cancer. And so these are small uh, rounded bits, if you will, that are accretionary that will, will be transported a little bit and then they'll grow upward and then they get transported and dropped around again. So these are spherical cyanobacterial colonies. So you can get pyramids, you can get columns, you can get domes, you can get planar stromatolites, you can get all these various kinds of stromatolytic growths or cyanobacterial growths, in fact. When you get into some of the younger rocks, this is a friend of mine, uh, Ben Detillo here, who's worked in uh, the, well, he's worked in uh, in New Mexico. He also works in the Great Basin with uh, Dr. Jim Miller and I. And so when we go out and we like to look at these reefs, and because the reefs are really spectacular, just like being in the modern tropical settings where you can dive on a reef, you're really diving when you're back then and looking at cross sections of reefs that existed 500 or 480 million years ago. 520 million years, years ago sometimes. And so these are all ones that you would have in a carbonate bank that covered much of North America. And so these are from Waco. Well, it's close to Waco tanks, but the Waco Mountains in West Texas here. So uh, that's a stromatolite right there. Pretty cool looking sort of structure. So if that's the stromatolites, that's the ones that are the organosedimentary structures. Thrombolites and oncoids are kind of related to them. Oncoids or oncolites are the ones that are slightly rounded when they, the cyanobacterial growths get rotated and so forth and roll around in the ocean. Uh, the thrombolites in a little slightly deeper water. So stromatolites, thrombolites, and oncoids, your first three for microfossils. Here are some more microfossils, and we've got five of them essentially to talk about. And some of them are more important than other ones. You know, I wouldn't say more important. They're certainly less obscure. There's a couple of them that are less obscure than other ones. So for instance, when we talk about radial area, we're usually talking about deep water sorts of 
microfossils, things that are really, really tiny, like tens of microns, 20 microns across, things like that. Forams, on the other hand, are single-celled organisms that belong to uh, a group that's called the uh, foraminifera. So forams is short for foraminifera. Uh, diatoms, another one of these. We're going to look at each one of these in detail, but we'll start with the radiolarians first. The diatoms, dinoflagellates, and then finally into the coccoliths or coccoliths. And so radiolarians we'll start with first. They make their skeleton out of, of silica. Uh, they're very elaborate sort of uh, structures that they make. They belong to the protist. Now, protist means that it's a single-celled organism. It is a eukaryotic organism. Yeah, they're eukaryotic organism. In other words, they have a cell nucleus. And they belong to the phylum sar sarco... Oh, I, I, I used to know... Well, anyway, the subphylum Sarcodina, I know that, Sarcomastigophora, Mastigophora, I think it is. Uh, but anyway, you're going to call them radiolarians <laughs> regardless, okay? And they're very beautiful, actually, sort of organisms. And so Alexander von Humboldt helped to, to try to, he helped a, a guy who was a, a scientist who kind of followed up on his work. His name was Ernst Heichel, and Ernst Heichel went in and he studied these microfossils like this, like the radiolarians, and he made these very elaborate etchings of, of radiolarians. And so he made, he was really an artist. And so he would hand paint them and so forth, what he was looking at in a microscope. And so um, they're like amoeba, like, so they're, but they're made with, with a skeleton that's made out of silica. Uh, it's a type of silica, in fact, that's like related to opal. There are different kinds of silica. So it is, it forms an ooze in the modern oceans. And so it's kind of amorphous, if you will, until it finally sets up. And so most of the time they're made out of silica. There's the rare ones that are made out of strontium sulfate as well. Now these things have been around from the early Cambrian all the way into the modern times here. Uh, so we don't know of any, in other words, in the Proterozoic, but, uh, but, and they have had some extinctions as well. So the Permian boundary caused the extinction of many of these things. The KPG boundary as well. And then finally, during the Neogene and the Paleogene, there was sort of a die-off of some of the radiolarians as well. But they form radiolarian ooze, and in the deep water, they commonly accumulate in, in a gel-like substance at the seafloor, and then eventually it forms a product known as navaculite. And so in Arkansas, there's a rock called... Arkansas Navaculite that's made out of radiolarian ooze. And so kind of neat. It's almost like chert, except that it actually has skeletal fossils that compose it. Um, here's some of those incredible illustrations by Ernst Heichel. Um, so these things are like vases, or they are spiky sort of things. And so you can see some on the left from a photomicrograph where they've been loosely mounted uh, or not even mounted at all perhaps and then a photograph taken so you can actually see what they look like uh, in detail on the left hand side from the microscope on the right hand side was Ernst Heichel's illustrations of these things from looking at the microscopic images here's what they look like up close so some of these things are globular balls sometimes the nucleus is in the center of these things a little bit more protected they have the spikes on there probably to keep other organisms from from eating them you know and and so um things that would filter feed would obviously get some of this material and ingest it as well so next we're going on to the foraminifera and they include the protists and the protists are single-celled organisms once again and we're in the family sarcodina again but we're in the order foraminifera though. And that's the important thing to remember here. So forams are bigger, typically, than what radiolaria are. So there was once a photograph taken uh, uh, that showed the contrast between dinoflagellates, which were just incredibly tiny, and there was a dinoflagellate that was sticking to one of those spikes on a radiolarian, and then that radiolarian was wedged into the opening that would form just kind of a a small opening that was just a few microns or maybe 10 microns across uh, in one of the protists here. And so these, these foraminiferal protists, in fact, 
Uh, many of these are marine, but there are some that are non-marine. They can either be calcareous or they can be pieces of sand that were glued together by the organism. And so these are sort of like amoebas too, where they would form actually a skeleton. And so these things would form an exotic sort of skeleton as well. They've been around since uh, the Cambrian. They're still around today. So you can go to the ocean today and sieve these things out of beach sands or you can get into the deep water. And that's one of the ways that we can tell um, water depth in relatively modern, um, well, at least Holocene to uh, yeah, Neogene sort of like settings. You can tell what sort of water depth you're in based on where these things live and where they're found in the uh, in the sediments in the ocean on the ocean floor. Um, they sometimes are associated with paleoclimatology. There are certain protists that will actually, or forams that will actually have coiling to the right, or they can coil to the left. And so the if you count, you know, which ones you see, there are certain warm conditions where they're right coiling and maybe cooler conditions where they're left coiling or vice versa. Uh, but anyway, they're very useful, especially for cer certain ages of rock. They really kind of hit their peak during Mississippian time. So in the middle of the Paleozoic, all of a sudden we've got a lot of forams around. And then they began to evolve. There's a, there's a group called the Endothyroids. And so the Endothyroids gave rise to what is probably the most important group of all in the protists, uh, in, the, in the forams, in fact, at least for the Paleozoic. Uh, the modern ones are important for determining water depth. The ancient ones are more important for determining what time period that you were actually looking at those rocks. Those were a special group of forams that were known as fusilinids. So fusilinids are what we call an index fossil. So this is a new term to commit to memory. An index fossil has a short time span okay so it's only found in the short length of you know thickness of rock if you will they undergo rapid evolution and then they have a very widespread distribution around the world and so the fusilinids in fact are useful for the pennsylvanian and permian age rocks and they are the descendants in fact of the endothyroids um, and so fusilinids if you go to kansas city you'll see fusilinid rocks cropping out around the kansas city area um, and in fact, I don't think we looked at this, but you'll see one in stratigraphy when you take that next year. But um, the fusilinids are what they call wheat fossils. It's the state fossil of Kansas, in fact. So fusilinids look like the wheat variety known as triticale. Triticale has sort of like a kind of a Nerf football shape, if you will. And so it has a spiral to it that's much like the football shape as well. It doesn't spiral like a typical gastropod or anything like that, but instead it spiral like a like like a nerf football. If you throw a spiral, it spirals like this along that long axis of the coiling, and so fusilin. It's very cool that way. Wheat fossils. Uh, the common name for actually it's the it's the genus Triticides, which recalls triticale, the type of wheat, and so Triticides is a state fossil of Kansas the wheat fossil. Okay, so here are some photographs of radiolarians and then some of some agglutinated in this. No, I think those are actually calcareous. Those are some forams. These are roughly the same size here, but radiolarians can be quite small at some times. And the reason why these are roughly the same size, let me, let me tell you this, okay? Some of those fusilinids we were talking about, a single cell organism, this is, this is one for the Guinness Book of World Records, practically. Some fusilinids are up to two or two and a half or three centimeters long, a single-celled organism, with a skeleton around them, right? They secrete their own skeleton. And so here you can see some of the smaller forams are roughly the same size as the radiolarians. Uh, but, but here's another foram here. It's partially porous, and so it has an interchange. Uh, with the you know the cellular materials inside of the skeleton for the most part, and maybe right at the edge of the growing edge of the uh, of the skeleton itself. Um, so those are forams. In this next image, you can see some of the various shapes of these things. Some of them are called bicereals, so they they tend to grow one, two, three, four upwards, and then some of them grow in like coils. 
Um, there's a whole bunch of different sort of shapes to these things. So uh, the modern ones. Um, there's a real common uh, myelinid, uh, milliolinid uh, uh, gastro or, or um, uh, forams are pretty common in. Uh, so they're not fusilinids anymore, but milliolinid, milliolinid uh, forams. There's other ones like uh, plan orbis, like the, the plan of spiral one that's down in the lower right hand side here. And some of these can actually be, you know, almost a centimeter in size as well. So uh, they grow in Florida, like a Florida bay and, and maybe, um, yeah, not so much on the ocean side, but more on the Florida bay side. Um, here's some more forams you can see in a, you know, sort of like a, water i guess you're looking through here and so those are forams and they look a little bit like cephalopods don't they they have that sort of serial sort of like spiraling uh to them there's an agglutinated foram on the right hand side that takes bits and pieces of the shells of other you know animals that have lived and died or things that have shed their skeletons and so they can actually piece it together like bricks essentially and form their skeletons that way um pretty cool Here's a fusilinid that gives you that idea of what that spiral looks like. And so it's spiraling this way. And uh, you can see some of the triticides down here, named for triticale wheat in the very bottom here. And so those are a type of fusilinid. Again, it's an index fossil, means it has a short time range within the sedimentary succession. It has a wide uh, geographic distribution, and they tended to have evolved fairly rapidly. And the way that people identify these fusilinids, they do it from the shell structure itself. I have some funny names. I'm going to go ahead and tell you here because uh, when these things grow, they will sometimes backfill those sort of like segments that look like little septi that are dividing the spiral as it goes outward. So the vertical pieces that kind of break it apart there. They'll sometimes put in a layer on the inside of that. And they, they, they have a structure called schwagerinid, okay? So S-C-H-W-A-G-E-R-I-N-I-D, schwagerinid uh, structure. And it used to be that the base of the Permian was defined by a fusilinid called pseudo, pseudo schwagerina. Uh, and so it's, um, yeah, so they were that useful, in fact, is index fossils. So... Rapid evolution, widespread distribution, but a narrow time range over which they existed. And so that's Triticides down here at the bottom. Looks like Triticale. Um, we're going to go on next. Okay, so we have the stromatolites behind us, of course. We have uh, radial area. We have the forams. And we're just going to branch off into things that are a little bit smaller now, like the diatoms. Maybe you've heard of diatomaceous earth. Uh, diatomaceous earth is a, is a sort of powder that you can put on your dog to kill fleas. Diatoms are so small that on a flea, the diatom will actually wedge in between the plates on the back of a, of a flea, and it will actually kill the flea, in fact. So they, they kind of, uh, it's an abrasive, if you will, as well. So diatoms are actually a type of algae. Again, a single cell organisms, but they're a type of algae in this case. Um, so... They're marine and non-marine. They actually belong to a group called the Chromista in the phylum Bacillaria, Bacillariophyta. Um, they are abundant, in fact, and so diatoms are very common. They can grow in uh, some of the lakes, in fact, uh, so they're in freshwater lakes as well. Uh, they're unicellular, or they can be colonial as well, and so the actual skeleton of a diatom is called a frustrule, frustrule and uh, they're usually very small. They're smaller than the radial areas, as we've already mentioned here. They can be spherical, cylindrical, various shapes. They go from the early Cretaceous, so these are not things that you would see in the Paleozoic, but they go from the early Cretaceous into recent sediments here. So diatomaceous earth. Uh, they mine diatomaceous earth for an abrasive, so that's why they have a certain usefulness, as well as like a flea killer, for that matter. Um, yeah, I don't think your dogs really like diatomaceous earth, so, you know, it's like it's kind of an irritant to the skin as well, but it's better than having fleas, I guess you could say. Um, dinoflagellates are another group, and so we're going to, they're the kingdom protus, and they belong to dinoflagellata, and you may know of something called the red tide, and so the red tide causes fish kills in places like South Florida. Uh, 
Um, the red tide is one of the byproducts that you get from warming of the oceans. Those shallow oceans have diatoms that bloom every once in a while, and they're bloom blooming more regularly in the warmer water of the Gulf of Mexico in killing fish. So diatoms are toxic uh, to fish, and that causes the red tide. People don't like them because the dead fish smell. <laughs> so you don't want to have a beachfront cottage with the red tide out there. Uh, but there's some bad water off of, you know, the southern peninsula, the southern part off the Everglades and so forth. And so it's, it's, it's a real problem in places. And so the red tide can kill things. Now, dinoflagellates themselves are not red, but they're composed of silica, one, once again, like the radiolarians, like the diatoms. Both of those are composed of, of, uh, of silica as well. So, and they use the flagella to actually... Uh, swim around, okay? Okay, just to show you what we were talking about. Here's some diatoms. This is what the diatoms look like. This is what more diatoms look like. These are cylindrical ones, and you can see they're quite small, and you're having to use a scanning electron microscope to see these sorts of things. And then once we get into, well, even more diatoms here, again, they have a very elaborate shape. These are arranged in a nice uh, picturesque sort of view here. Uh, typically, you don't see them that close together. And then when you look at uh, even more of them up close like this, they have appendages that tend to stick out, and they have that sort of meshwork as well uh, that uh, silica gets precipitated from the organic materials in the cell itself. Um, I don't have any good dinoflagellates to show you, so anyway, they're, they're also sort of uh, uh, very small. They're even smaller than what these diatoms are. So uh, next on the list are a group that are near and dear to my heart. They're called the coccolis, since or coccolis, some people call them, but coccolis are in the chromista as well, which puts them in as, as a kind of algae. And they belong to the phylum haptophyta, which I don't know exactly what that means, but they are very small as well. And they're little tiny algal balls, and they actually secrete a skeleton that's made out of little tiny shields, if you will. So those shields actually... Uh, are encrusted around the outside of this out. I'm doing it like this. They're really, really tiny. They're microscopic, right? And so, but they're really important when it comes to the Cretaceous, as it turns out. Cretaceous stands for chalk. It's a chalky earth, right? And so chalk is is essential for, like, you know, in the old days, you would use the chalk, which is a type of rock, on a slate, and, uh, and, of course, you know about the White Cliffs of Dover, and actually the Paris Basin is also uh, composed of chalk, Cretaceous chalks. And there's even chalk in West uh, Kansas, and so in the, in the chalk hills of Kansas, and so around Fort Hayes in that area, lots of chalk. In fact, so much chalk out there, they didn't have enough trees, they used chalk in order to make their fence posts. So they have a name for that part of the country in Kansas. They call it fence post country. And so there's actually a fence post um, member of, I think it's the Niobrara Formation. And so the fence post member, they cut, you know, rectangular blocks of that material and then bury it just like you would a wooden fence post. Uh, they don't wear out. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Um they're made out of the plates, though. They're made out of the plates of these organisms that were called coccolis or coccolis. And so they have you know, they're calcite, right? So you can drop acid on chalk and it'll fizz. And they're very abundant in Cretaceous age rocks. And if you don't believe that, here's a look at some of those plates. There's an individual plate on the right-hand side, and these are a collection of plates on the left-hand side surrounding that alga. And uh, you can see here's more of them. They sometimes have trumpet shaped like They have elaborate shapes, you know, but um, well, I don't show you a picture of the White Cliffs of Dover, but you can look it up. The White Cliffs of Dover, really astounding, right? In the Paris, okay, I have to tell you a little bit more. In the Paris Basin, there are caves underneath, uh, you know, like next to the Loire Valley, okay? In the Loire Valley, it's all Cretaceous Age chalks around there. They found out early on that you could cut blocks out of that chalk and stack them up to form chateaus. And so chateaus are made out of chalk, essentially. And so the chateaus, we build all these giant blocks of, of chalk, and it gets a case hardening on the outside. So when chalk is exposed to rainwater, it actually sets up in a hard crust on the outside. 
And so you could build these castles and these chateaus in the Loire Valley quite easily compared to just cutting blocks of rock and making a cathedral, perhaps, or something like that. So the chateaus primarily, at least in the Loire Valley, in the Paris Basin area, composed of chalk. Now, the interesting part is they, they actually went underground when they mined the chalk blocks out because it's easy to cut. And they could cut rooms out of the chalk, and so they would cut blocks and carry them out into the daylight. Well, once you got finished mining that material, all of a sudden you've got an underground dwelling that you could live in. And so the troglodytes lived in these caves that were in, in, in <laughs> where they mined out the chalk. Now, if you go to the Loire Valley today, you can go and eat in some of these caves. So the troglodyte caves are there where people lived, and then there are also restaurants and some of these things. And so if you go into those caves, you have to realize it's like, well, what can you grow in a cave? Well, if you have a little bit of artificial light in there, you can actually grow snails. And so they make escargot by growing snails in these caves, and they also grow mushrooms. And so the mushrooms, like the, I forget what it's called, the Paris blue mushroom, is like, there's some outstanding mushrooms in France. They, they really know their cuisine, right? So you can have escargot, mushrooms, bread that was cooked in an oven that was vented to the surface through a tunnel, okay, over the, over the oven, and have this wonderful echoey sort of like restaurant uh, where you have these delicacies. And so it's really quite spectacular when you go to places like that. And so you get a bit of the culture. The bread that they cook in these places, right? So, okay, bread, escargot, mushrooms, and uh, and some of the wine that was grown on the surface as well. So the grains and the, and the grapes were grown on the surface. The, the mushrooms and the, the snails were grown in the cave and in the quarry, underground quarry. Um, really quite spectacular. That's about the chalk of the, of the Paris Basin in the Loire Valley. And so Loire Valley... Um, there's a connection to science there as well. I think that's one of the last places that uh, um, Leonardo spent some of his time. He was actually at Blau in the Loire Valley, and I think that he spent some of his last years in France there. Okay, so that gets us through some of the microfossils. We've talked about stromatolites, thrombolites, onchoids. We've talked about radial area, forams, especially the fusilinids, which are a good index fossil. You know what an index fossil is now. You've also seen diatoms and dinoflagellates and lastly, uh, coccolis. And so that's for our microfossils. And I'm going to cut it here and we'll talk more about uh, the next one on the list will be the sponges. And so sponges coming up. Thanks. Talk to you in a minute.